My name is Sean Lanou. I'm a sales technical training specialist for Continental Automotive Systems. And I have here with me Dave McClay. He is the manager of new product development, uh, also out of Allentown, Pennsylvania. Dave and I will answer any questions uh, after the uh, presentation. Little bit of history real quick. Uh, TREAD Act was passed in 2000, partially in response to a major tire recall. In the TREAD Act, there was a requirement from NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, uh, to respond. And that response was the FMVSS 138. The FMVSS 138 dictates the use of TPMS on four-wheeled vehicles. It was published April 8th of 2005. It is a technology neutral standard. It applies to passenger cars, multi-purpose vehicles, trucks, buses, anything under 10,000 pounds or less, but it does not include vehicles with dual wheels on an axle. And there are currently five states right now that inspect TPMS and they require the light to be off to pass the inspection. Those states are Hawaii, Rhode Island, Vermont, West Virginia. There's four that must be off. In New York, they inspect it, but the light does not have to be off. The rule was phased in over three years and was 100% mandated in 08. Specific owner's manual text is now required. And since it is a mandatory safety item, it cannot knowingly be disabled by an OEM or aftermarket service provider. If a vehicle comes into a shop with working TPMS, it must leave with working TPMS. Now that can get complicated. Let's say a vehicle comes into the shop with TPMS light already on, that problem does not have to be fixed. It can leave with the light on. But you cannot knowingly disable any part of that system to turn that light off. So let's say they have a bad sensor. You don't have one in stock in a shop. It's OK but you cannot do anything to make that light go away unless you fix that problem. There are two levels to this rule. Number one is to detect and provide a warning to the driver within 20 minutes of a low pressure in one or more of the vehicle's tires. And second, it must also indicate when the system is malfunctioned. There are two different low pressure warning indicators allowed by the standard. One is an icon that you see on the dash. The other is a top view of the vehicle showing all four tires outside. The TPMS light is displayed after the key is turned on for two to five seconds. After that, the light will either go off or remain constant, which means you have one or more tires with low pressure. The second is it will flash, flashing for 60 to 90 seconds. That indicates a system fault. Some vehicles, after the 60 to 90 seconds, the light remains on, and in some vehicles, the light will turn off. In both cases, this will stay like this until the fault is fixed or the key is turned off. But then when you start the vehicle again or turn the key back to the on position, this whole cycle will repeat. There are currently two methods or two systems in use today for detecting air pressure in vehicles' tires. You have an indirect system, and it operates in conjunction with the wheel speed sensors and the anti-lock brake system, or the ABS system. And then there's the direct system. 
This uh, system uses the sensors inside the tires and it offers many maintenance and service opportunities to people in the business such as replacing sensors and service kits. There are currently an estimated 95% or more of all TPMS equipped vehicles in the U.S. using direct systems right now. An example of an indirect system, they measure air pressure inside the tire but via wheel rotation and other available signals along with data processing. This can indirectly determine if a tire up to four is underinflated. On a direct system, you have pressure sensors in each tire. The sensors physically measure pressure in each tire and report it to the vehicle's instrument cluster or a corresponding monitor. And then come the scan tools that we need in the industry. They have many functions depending on brand and model. They can be very basic or very advanced. They are used in the relearn process to trigger a sensor. Some tools also have the OBD capability. This is used on certain vehicles when doing a relearn via OBD, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The sensor IDs are stored into the tool and then transferred from the tool to the vehicle via OBD2 connector. Here's just an example of some of the tools in use today. And I'm sure some of you have access to tools or have used a tool. To service TPMS, your shop or you must have a tool. Tools are used to communicate with the sensor. Some of us have probably heard 315, 433, 314.9. That's just a start. I want to show you some examples of the car manufacturer protocols that we're working with today. TPMS has created complexity and confusion for the aftermarket. Different behaviors, modes, protocols, different frequency, different baud rates, different relearns. Again, complexity and confusion in the aftermarket. Along with the complexity and confusion, did you know that TPMS sensors must follow the FCC regulation? The FCC says or dictates communication in all 50 states, District of Columbia, and the U.S. territories. They regulate how the sensors transmit. They dictate when a device can communicate, how long it can communicate, how often and the power of the device. All TPMS sensors must follow the FCC regulation. Now getting back to the tool. Here's an example of a manual relearn process. You perform a relearn when a sensor is changed. This is on some Ford vehicles. Uh, it's initiated with a series of key on off cycles and a pressing of the parking brake and some more cycles. The technician then uses a scan tool to trigger each tire sensor, normally starting with the left front, working clockwise around the vehicle. The vehicle's horn honks after each sensor is learned, and then when a relearn is complete, you usually hear two horn honks, symbolizing the relearn was successful. Another manual relearn process this is used on some GM vehicles. This process is initiated by turning the ignition on and pressing the key fobs, door lock and unlock buttons at the same time. On some of the GM vehicles, you can also use the driver information center. The vehicle honks twice to indicate it is now in a relearn mode. It also turns a parking light on in the location that you're supposed to do the relearn for each tire. The vehicle's horn will honk after each sensor is learned. A successful relearn on this one also is a double horn honk. Those are just two examples of the process 
for a direct system relearn. Indirect systems do not require a relearn, but do typically require recalibration after changing tires or adding air into a tire. Here's where the OBD comes into play. On many Asian vehicles, the relearn procedure requires uploading the sensor IDs to the vehicle via OBD. Not a lot of tools out there have this capability. A scan tool with OBD is required. Each sensor is triggered similar to the other learning processes, but the ID of the sensor is then stored in the tool. After each one is scanned, you then connect the tool via OBD, follow the instructions on the tool, and you'll upload those IDs to the vehicle. This adds more complexity. It's not difficult, but it's something different. And I have heard in many shops, you mean I have to buy another tool? They already have a tool that we used three, four, five, six years ago, and now this is added more and the tool they have doesn't work. Many Chrysler and some European Asian vehicles have the capability of an auto relearn. Automatic learning of IDs allow new IDs to be learned in the receiver of the vehicle. An average auto relearn takes about five minutes or less when the vehicle is driven above a certain speed. Uh, that speed is set by the manufacturer of the vehicle. This relearn, though, can be a reassurance on some vehicles that you required to do via OBD. Some aftermarket sensors out there skip these relearning procedures by cloning. This is possible in some instances. However, cloning alone cannot verify system functionality, clear any trouble codes, or update the sensor on the vehicle after a tire rotation. This is just an example of a simple system with no localization. Pressures received from the sensors, checked against the threshold, and without localization, only a telltale light is displayed, no indication where the fault is or the underinflated tire, but it's just a telltale. Still gives them a warning. This is an example of full localization using three LF receivers or antennas. This system recognizes and locates the left rear, the right rear, the right front, and since sensor A does not have an LF trigger, the system says, I see an ID. It must be in that other spot. It never answered, so it stores it there, and the full localization is complete. Some OEMs also offer a display that show where the sensors are located and the respective pressure in each tire. This is just an example of an LF initiator location. They're usually located in the wheel well with typically a minimum of three per vehicle. This is not on all vehicles, and the latest TPMS systems do not require LF antennas in the wheel wells to perform a localization process, but they are out there. What's the value of TPMS? There is a value to TPMS maintenance in our shops. It is important to check tire pressure, but why do we check tire pressure? Because according to NHTSA, or Traffic Safety Administration, Underinflated tires may cause effect fuel economy, loss of control, hydroplaning, stopping distances are increased, increased tire wear, and cause tire failures. NHTSA estimates that underinflated tires contribute to over 600 fatalities a year. In 2012, the Rubber Manufacturers Association, or the RMA, found that only 18% of vehicles had at least four properly inflated tires. 52% of drivers wrongly believe that the inflation pressure 
is listed on the tire itself. Only 17% of drivers are tire smart or know how to properly check the tire. Here's a typical placard. Many of you have seen those. That is a cold inflation pressure. It is the placard pressure. This is the pressure that TPMS systems in the U.S. use when referring to the 25% threshold. This appears in the driver's door jam of all late model vehicles. Let's talk a little bit about tire pressure. Most drivers do not understand cold inflation pressure. Vehicle performance is engineered to a specific pressure, load capacity, ride handling, braking, fuel economy, and this specific pressure that they come up with is the recommended cold inflation pressure. And cold does not mean that the pressure is measured in the winter, but rather after the vehicle's been sitting for a while or driven very short period of time. Subsequent driving induced pressure increases are expected and accounted for. We know when temperature goes up, pressure goes up. Temperature goes down, pressure goes down. We also have seasonal effects. Pressure slowly changes throughout the year as the temperature rises in the spring and summer and falls in autumn and winter. Daily effects, again, slowly increases throughout the morning and the afternoon and then falls. Some areas you have larger temperature changes. Rule of thumb is about one PSI for every 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Same applies while driving. Pressure increases as we start driving. As we continue driving, it stabilizes. And then we park or slow down, it'll fall down again. And then there's, of course, a natural loss. One PSI every month. We need our customers to retain the proper placard information pressure year round. So what we've seen on these five slides previously, that circled area shows where that TPMS light can be an annoyance to a customer and cause you in a shop to try and figure out what's going on here. Customer says light comes on in the morning, but as he drives to work, it goes off. Or it comes on in the morning, parks the car, gets out after work, temperature rose, and the light's off. It's on and off. So it is important to know the warning signs and understand the telltale. Three sensor types currently in use today, clamp in, snap in, and a banded or valveless. More designs are expected and will be seen in the future. That's just an example of a clamp in. Many of you have seen that. Um, that's the, one of the most common out there. Now, sensor opportunity. It is estimated there are 80 million plus vehicles on the roads today with TPMS. That's 320 million sensors on the road. With the rollout of TPMS going on seven years, Continental Automotive Systems estimate that 9.8 million sensors will fail in 2013 due to a battery failure. This number is huge. If you're in the business, you will probably see a TPMS-related issue almost every day. Why do we replace the service parts kit? For the same reason we replace the rubber valve stem today. Over time, rubber deteriorates, it cracks, it can lead to slow leaks that are very hard to find. Replacing the service kits will reduce the possibility for corrosion. Leaving them in can lead to corrosion so bad that the nut or core are seized to the valve stem. If that happens, now your customer has to pay for a new sensor. TPMS service kits are designed for single use. Preventative maintenance is the reason for installing the kits. You help maximize the life of the much more expensive sensor by replacing the service kits at regular tire intervals. 
OE sensor manufacturers state that it's mandatory to replace service kits each time the tire is serviced. You don't want that vehicle back due to leaks that are hard to detect. And then shown is just a variety of replacement parts. And these parts are not typical replacement parts to a consumer. They are now an important mandated safety component. Mr. Moose Knot. Mr. Moose Knot was getting ready to go on a trip. He needed to get new tires. He was sold some new tires, installed, balanced, mounted, out the door. He was on his way. About six months later, he comes back. Some of you might know where I'm going with this. He said his TPMS light was on. Maybe he picked up a nail. He wasn't sure. He had to put air in it a few times. Technician removes it from the vehicle, looks at it, inspects it, rolls it on the ground, looks for nails, doesn't see anything, inflates it up 40, 45 PSI, puts it in some water, spins it around, looks at it like we all do, no bubbles, thinks, you know, well, must have been a natural loss, slow leak. We don't know what it is. Let me inflate it up. I can't find anything wrong. I'll tighten the valve core just to make sure it wasn't coming out of there. Installs it on the vehicle, says, have a great day. I didn't find anything, but it's okay. He drives away. He comes back the next day. The light's on. He doesn't understand. You checked this. Now he's back again. So this is the third time he's been in. First time he bought tires. Second time something was wrong. Now the third time something's wrong, and you supposedly fixed it for me. Service kits. The little rubber seal could have a crack in it that is not detectable. That's why we've got to replace these service kits. A leak today can be fixed. A leak tomorrow might mean that you lost a customer. Service kit opportunity is growing rapidly. Here's an estimated breakdown of re, uh, vehicles requiring tires with traditional va rubber valve stems versus TPMS valve stems. This year, about half of the vehicles on the road have TPMS valve stems. At the rate we're going, only a quarter of the vehicles on the road by 2016 will have traditional valve stems. We have opportunities. Many sensor battery failures, added sensor sales with winter tires, aftermarket rims, balancing compounds, corrosion, improper maintenance, hazards such as collision, potholes, curbs, tire sealing. It's generally acceptable with TPMS, but Use caution. Customers should have a professional repair made after they use a tire sealant. Prompt cleaning of the sensor, tire, and wheel is highly recommended. And TPMS service requirements can happen from day one. By the car, they could have a problem. They could hit a curb. Something could happen. This is unlike any other replacement parts that we see. Some of the problems we see today, uh, donut spare, lights on. Customer might not understand why did my light come on, the tire's inflated, they don't know that there's a sensor in every wheel. Anything metallic in the way of the signal can cause interference. So metallic window tint, that can cause problems. We already spoke about the difference of the, the telltale flashes versus solid the customers, uh, consumers don't know that. We have to educate them. The electroless nickel plated valve cores that are required. So many shops are used to grabbing a valve core off the tire machine, screwing it in. Brass valve cores are going to cause corrosion. We know that. We've seen it. We have to pay attention. Galvanic corrosion can also occur with chrome valve caps on the aluminum valve stems. The electrochemically different metals react when wet, causes seizing. There's so many sensors out there right now, you take the valve cap off and half the sensor comes with it, the valve stem. 
Same with un, if you have to remove it. You go to untake, take off the nut off the uh, valve stem, and the whole thing breaks apart in your hand. Use only quality parts. TPMS is a product solely designed to reduce tire-related accidents and fatalities. Copycat TPMS parts have not been designed or validated to meet the quality level of the OEM. Validated parts are tested against the same quality levels as the OEM standards. Don't jeopardize the customer or consumer safety. Use only OE validated TPMS parts. With aftermarket tires and wheels, it's extremely important to note that the low tire warning threshold is 25% below the vehicle manufacturer's recommended cold inflation tire pressure or the placard pressure. Changing to non-OE tires that have a differ different recommended tire pressure doesn't change the warning at all. For example, 32 PSI on the placard means our light's going to go on at about 24 PSI. Regardless of what the inflation pressure is recommended for aftermarket tires, the TPMS low tire warning lamp will illuminate at 24 PSI. With some aftermarket wheel tire combinations today, that's pretty low. We have to remember this. I got to say, take your time. We become frustrated. Be sure to check service information or sensor manufacturer information. During a relearn process, the vehicle wants only one sensor communicating at a time. It's an intelligence system and will realize if there's interference. If you have a problem or a technician has a problem, wait 20 minutes or so. Come back. You could have a car next to you in the bay. You should test the system electrically via a tool, the dash lights, do a visual check of the parts for corrosion before starting any work on a vehicle with TPMS. Explain to the customer if there are any TPMS issues prior to taking their keys. You don't want that customer to hold you accountable for damage to a TPMS sensor. A common thing, we've heard it before, a lot of people have heard it before. It worked when I dropped it off. Where does your shop stand or where do you stand? Do you look for the dash light every time a customer's vehicle comes into the bay? Do you visually inspect the vehicle's stems, hex nut, seal, cap, when it's equipped, if equipped with TPMS? Do you document when a car has TPMS and whether it's functional or non-functional? Do you inform the customer of the benefits of TPMS, whether there's a sales opportunity or not? Do you have a reliable source to identify replacement sensors, service kits, a relearn procedure. Do you know who to call for TPMS troubleshooting help? 